So Jayant, good to see you back. Good to Hope see you. Hope you had a great weekend. Yes, uh, this weekend I was playing a father-daughter Valentine's Day tournament with my with my daughter. And then we all ended up at your place. You know that. I mean, you know, thank yes. you for again. <laughs> always welcome, always welcome. You know, I had a fun time. I saw Siona after a very long time. Yes. So she's really grown up and I, I've seen the kind of, you know, the badminton that she's playing. Of course, I always asked you whether you're using AI for that. And of course, talking about AI, we have with us uh, uh, Shrikant uh, Vilamakanni, uh, who is the co-founder, group CEO and vice chairman of Fractal. Now, Fractal is one of the companies that, if you remember, we know there was Fractal Analytics because it's yes. like a like 2000, so almost a 24-year-old company. Correct. And, uh, you know, the interesting part is, uh, Shrikant, your journey is amazing. I mean, it's one of the few unicorns that has posted a profit, I think, in FY23, if I'm not mistaken. And also, you have, you know, you amaze me because you've spoken about a... Uh, aim and ambition of you know becoming a 15 billion dollar revenue company mind you uh, viewers and listeners i have not made any error in that it's not a 15 billion dollar valuation it's a 15 billion dollar revenue and knowing shrikant uh, he will tell us of how he plans to achieve that well of course uh, with uh, ai and gen ai picking up moment uh, we'll find out uh, soon uh, how the path has become smoother and uh, if you look at uh, Shrikant's own uh, 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 roadmap, his path that he has taken, it's a very different thing because he himself, uh, you know, uh, can chart a roadmap for, he works with a lot of enterprises, uh, uh, you know, shows them uh, the way in his own company also he has done it. Of course, he is uh, also um, an alumni of uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, IIT Delhi, and of course, I am uh, Ahmedabad. And uh, one of his co-founders uh, is Pranay Agarwal. Uh, right, uh, Shrikant? I, I hope I got all my facts right. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Shrikant, before we segue, uh, uh, you know, talking about more about Fractal, a lot of interesting things are happening in the field of AI. In fact, there's a development every day, every hour. It just look at Twitter and you probably, you're inundated with the kind of stuff. It's very hard for any one person to, you know, keep track of uh, what's happening in this field. Just a few things that I, uh, you know, got my attention. Of course, one thing that is doing the rounds is uh, OpenAI achieved a revenue milestone of $2 billion in December 23. Then, uh, you know, uh, Sam Altman has been speaking about, I mean, he has not spoken about it, but the, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal that carried this uh, report saying that uh, uh, he wants to reshape the semiconductor ecosystem and uh, uh, attributing it to sources. They said that uh, he's uh, planning to raise something like $7 trillion. So they were not talking, as, as we said last time also, it's two Indias or maybe the GDP or something or two Microsofts put together. Kind of, it's like... Crazy stuff. Uh, Shikant, your thoughts on just that fundraise? I mean, is there that much money even in the PE ecosystem? No, I don't think so. There's, I mean, th there are records being set every day in terms of how much private equity companies are raising. But exactly. 7 trillion uh, just it blows past everything, every such number. I don't know who made it up and how this is true and how can even this be possible. But I mean, you cannot blame Sam for not trying or not being ambitious. At least you have to give exactly, it exactly right. Yeah, yeah, for shooting for the stars and beyond. It, it it sure resonates with your own personality also because I've seen the kind of you know the setbacks that you yourself have received in your own uh, you know uh, path. Uh, and look at the pace at which incredible pace at which unicorns or startups become unicorns. You for you it I think it took you some twenty one years to become a unicorn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting thing. But uh, when we're looking uh, at AI, uh, I mean, I think we didn't even uh, when uh, Fractal, uh, you know, was founded into the year two thousand way back in then. We used to talk about Smack probably. I don't think we used to talk even about Smack. So <laughs> Smack was I mean, our ten years after we started. Ten years, ten years after, ten years after, after we started. Yes. Yes. 
<laughs> this was like the dot com bust, dot com boom, dot com bust. Those were the kind of times that you lived in. And I think we started talking about AI something sometime around 2015 or 16, where, you know, sort of the early kind of uh, conversation started happening. Now look at it. I mean, after last year, after Chat GPT gave a face to AI uh, in the form of generative AI, it simply exploded uh, out here. I love your thoughts on what's happening in this field, if you can, you know, sort of encapsulate, because you are a person who's looking at uh, all these trends uh, from the, you know, from the front in the battlefield, actually, and you're making a revenue from that. Exactly. Yeah, the, the story of AI is almost 65 plus years old. And for the first 50 of those years, it was all, I mean, now it looks quite uninteresting relatively speaking and it was all with the mindset that you will create rules and rules and rules and that's how ai will be made the old-fashioned ai and then it all started taking off in the mid 2000s uh, around 2010 that's when you started seeing results coming from some of the biggest labs uh, showing that deep learning as a way of solving problems which is very different from the rule-based ai this was learning with examples learning with data that sort of started taking off and in speech recognition, image recognition, uh, conversational AI, things started picking up quite quite a bit. And that is a time when some of the digital natives started investing heavily behind AI. So between 2010 and 2015, you saw Microsoft, IBM, uh, Google, companies like that start, starting to invest significantly in AI. By 2015, you saw the big Fortune 100 companies realize the value of AI, and they started actually having conversation at the board level where, you know, I, I did presentations to multiple boards where the idea was, okay, how was data differentiated for us? How is AI differentiated for us? From 2015 to 2020, it was all the Fortune 100s using AI. And post 2020, I think it's taken off significantly. And 2023 was a watershed moment and everyone, including 7 billion people on the planet, now have access to not just the consuming AI, but also using AI more actively like in a chat GPT-like situation. So it's been a fantastic journey. It's compounded. It has steadily improved in terms of accuracy and it has steadily shown magical qualities every so every so often. And I think we are at that point where it feels like we're ever so close to that moment when machines are as smart as humans across a wide range of tasks. But this is interesting that you, you know, you, I mean, you have actually very successfully put in the entire roadmap. I, I don't think uh, you, you could have done a better job on that. Uh, but, but when so when you look at this, of course, we all know that it's a 60 year old technology, machine learning itself is around 40 years. And most of the technology that we are talking today have been, you know, there, I won't say lying dormant, but uh, I mean, now that, uh, you know, uh, most companies are implementing it, that we are seeing the results out here. Now, just when we were wrapping our head around AI, when it was sort of becoming mature and we were just learning that, okay, this is the way, you know, it looks at, like machine learning looks at historical data, makes predictions, suddenly you're generating new content. And just when we were trying to wrap our head around you know, uh, uh, chat GPT and it, it trying to make sense of it. Then we started talking about it. the large language models. Then we started talking about large multi-language models. Then we started talking talking about large vision models. Then we are talking about, you know, uh, small language models and, you know, 10 other things. Uh, for the sake of our viewers and listeners, can you just simplify uh, the, uh, these concepts so that, you know, uh, they understand these concepts better? Yeah, I'll give you a real quick overview. So AI is a broad field. Anytime a machine can match or exceed human capability in any task, you can call it AI. So one of my favorite examples is if you have a recipe for cooking pasta, which is better than my recipe, yeah, I'll call it AI, even though even it's hard-coded, it doesn't matter. It's just because it matches or exceeds human performance on any task. So now within that broad field of AI, the most exciting part is machine learning, where machines are learning with experience. So if you give it a little data, it learns. So you give it five pictures of tiger, it has a better understanding of what a tiger is or what a dog is. That's about learning with examples. That's machine, all of machine learning. Within machine learning, deep learning is where you have this idea of creating networks that learn just like the human brain. These are deep neural networks, which are learning with examples. So it's machine learning, but it's a subset of machine learning. 
And within that subset of machine learning are what are called the large language models. These are actually built, built on a technology of predicting the next word. So you take a series of words, it's predicting the next word or a token. And by going through series of words and 10 trillion words in, in case of GPT-4, 10 trillion words of training, it learns and sort of has the compressed knowledge of the world. So that's the large language model thing. And then small language models are basically large language models without the elaborate largeness of it, which is the number of features. You take smaller number of features, it becomes a larger, smaller model. And you use, use it because you don't, you don't have the capacity to run a large model. It requires a lot of computing. So right. if you're purpose built for a small problem, you don't need the size of a large model. So that's the large, small language model. So that's in a nutshell what's happening. And the way these learn, and the you, you ask the question as to what has changed in this, right? This has been around for 60 years. The big thing that's changed is A, data. Data has exploded. Like GPT-4 had 10 trillion words to learn from. This wouldn't have been possible 10 or 15 years ago. Second is the computational horsepower. GPT-4 was built on 277,000 CPUs and 10,000 GPUs. So massive amounts of computational uh, expertise or computational uh, availability. Three is the, amount, the kinds of techniques. So neural networks were there, but lots of tweaks had happened between 1990s when Jeffrey Hinton wrote the first paper on neural networks to 2023. And all these things added up to something really useful. So when you combine the power of data, compute, and technology or techniques, and all of them exponentially improving, you had this explosion in the accuracy, and that's when we started seeing magical things like ChatGPT. It's so interesting that you say that because, of course, clearly when we are talking about data today, we're not only talking that run, we're talking about running out of data. We're talking yeah. of okay, the whole question of synthetic data. Uh, it's it's altogether another fact that we have not tapped into the video data and into the audio data and. Yeah. Uh, 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 other kind of data because I think a lot of work needs to be done there also. And when we're even talking about computing, interesting. I mean, we are talking about CPUs, we are talking about CPUs plus GPUs, we are talking about standalone GPUs, we are talking about uh, tensor processing units, we are talking about neural processing units, and we're also talking about ASICs. So this is pretty interesting. I mean, the kind of uh, range of computing power that we have. Uh, so uh, it, it's a pretty interesting uh, uh, field out there. When we, uh, in, in fact, you're dealing with a lot of these enterprises. Now, when you're looking at CXOs, they were earlier, you know, trying to wrap their head around uh, uh, what AI can do for them. Uh, probably many of those uh, models were getting mature. They were understanding because they're marrying the legacy platforms with uh, a lot of new age uh, kind of stuff uh, that is happening out there. And now suddenly th uh, they have been, they do not want to miss out on the Gen AI part of it. Uh, when they what is you know how how do you advise them as to how to look at this transition what are the things that you know are best suited to say the way of traditional ai that we look at and what are you know sort of can be migrated to gen ai because gen ai there's a lot of overlap in these things that you rightly pointed out yes so gen ai is just the latest version of ai right. um, and what it does is it expands a number of problems we can solve number one Number two, it is it, the conversation, the UI or the experience of working with AI is much stronger. Number three, it can handle a lot of amorphous other sorts of data. Earlier, all the previous AI was all, you know, get data into a very good shape before you can use it. Now it can handle much more messiness in data. So everything that you solve for inside organizations is still AI plus Gen AI. It's not that the traditional AI goes away. Almost every problem that you need to solve, you need the what we call as a discriminative AI and the generative AI. And the generative AI could be the layer of interface, could be the layer of knowledge coming, compressed knowledge of the internet that I just had mentioned. These things are coming from gen, gen AI and discriminative AI is coming from the, the structured data sets and the images and videos that they have stored on their own organization. Use that to use the predictive or the discriminative AI for that combine it with generative AI and solve the kinds of problems that you're solving. The problems haven't changed. It's just expanded. The number of problems have expanded. So it, the problems that I have seen over serving the largest companies on the planet for the last 20 something years are basically can be clubbed into five different areas. It's just the same five areas that keep coming in again and again. Number one, 
how do I know my customers better? How do I serve them better? How do I know my employees better? How do I serve them better? How do my shareholders better? How do I serve them better? How do I predict their future behavior? It's all about understanding the stakeholders that I'm serving, predicting their behavior and then shaping their behavior. That is the first one. Number two is I am running a big business. I'm running operations. I need to be efficient. I need to be productive. I need to uh, operationally be smart. So how do I reduce my risks? How do I make my marketing more effective? How do I make sure that my forecasts are in place? My supply chain is running on time. How do I make sure my operations are at the best shape possible? That's my second thing. Third thing is I need to innovate. I need to outcompete my competitors. I need to build products in the marketplace. They have to be good products. They have to win. The failure rate of those innovations have to be low. And I need to do them quicker and quicker, faster and faster. So how do I improve innovation? Three. Four is how do I build this company for the future? How do I sustain it? ESG, governance. This is all about the long-term future of the business, how reinventing business models. Four. And five is day-to-day -day tactical operational decision-making. Beyond all of this, there's still a lot of things that you're doing every day. How can you make those decisions a little smarter with data? So these are the five topics. They remain the same, except that now with Gen AI, you can solve them better. And you can solve a lot of problems inside the ex number of problems inside these five buckets has expanded a lot. So basically, you cannot lose sight of the fact that AI or Gen AI or whatever technology you're using is here to solve a business problem. Never put the cart before the horse. <laughs> Jen, you have also been seeing all these things. You know, you have uh, uh, seen. Uh, hordes of companies over this period of time. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for uh, Srikant. No, uh, I completely agree with Srikant when it comes to, you know, essentially the five buckets. Okay. And uh, what I've been, what in my uh, experience, what I've been observing is, uh, you know, companies wanting to implement, uh, you know, Gen AI. So, you know, Gen AI is the buzzword. Okay. So they just want to implement something small with it. Uh, Srikant, in my experience as an advisor and a consultant, what I've uh, observed is that people want a quick solution, a quick pilot, uh, but they don't understand, uh, you know, the need for uh, investing in uh, the right, uh, you know, uh, AI platform or the AI techniques. And, and they just think that, you know, we, we just we just can build an AI influencer or an AI, AI avatar. Okay. And I keep telling them, you know, think of AI as, as electricity. You might just want to, you know, uh, uh, turn on a bulb as a pilot or an experiment in one corner of your uh, house, but you still need to electrify your, uh, you know, you need to electrify your house. And then once, uh, you know, that electrification is done, you can turn on any appliances, you can turn on any fridges along with turning on your bulb, but then, you know, uh, it will be just incremental, but think of investing the right time and uh, energy in uh, electrifying your house or AI enabling your, your company. Is that also something that you observe uh, when you talk to clients? Uh, you know, at least I, I hear this among the long tail clients. Yeah, this is it's beautifully put, uh, Jayant. It's absolutely true. AI is the electricity. And yes, we need electrification um, before we can solve problems. I think my sense is that companies are also very keen to see value very quickly. Yes. They know that it's new. They know they want to compete in the marketplace. There are some very Im immediate priorities that they have in showing it to their customer, showing True. it to their employee, showing it to their stakeholders, stakeholders meaning their investor confidence. So they yeah. have to innovate. And sometimes you don't have the patience to go build the entire electrification. They want exactly. to first, and they also want to be able to convince their stakeholders and the CFOs and others to make sure that you have to make the right investments for the electrification piece. So they're, I think it's I think it's not a bad thing that they're very purpose driven and saying let's solve these problems and once I'm fully sure let me solve all the, the electrification yes. problem I'll solve it later I think it's I think it's it's okay uh, my other sense is that because you brought in the electrification analogy I'll, I'll add to your analogy a little bit sure. I also feel like intelligence is going to be available on tap like yeah. today you don't think of electricity that I need to configure any building for electricity. You can just plug in and electric intelligent, you know, electricity comes out of it without any problem. Right. I think what you are going to see is that the foundational model ecosystem will become like that, where you don't have to, if you're building anything and you're solving any problem, part of it comes directly by plugging into the socket and getting that intelligence mm. from the large language models. So that's another way to look at the electrification or electricity problem. And that I think is also powering 
how fast companies can solve problems. So now you have these foundation models. With that, the, the very specific problems that companies are trying to solve get accelerated, which yeah. is why we can solve problems much quicker than, let's say, a couple of years back. And actually, you're already seeing this electrification. The, I, 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 I always love that analogy, except I get a little perturbed when, you know, the current goes off <laughs> in Bangalore. Hey, so I, I hope, I'm from I the hope, telecom background. We can always yeah. use the mobile mobile wireless analogy. <laughs> exactly. I, I hope AI doesn't behave like the electricity here in Bangalore. Yeah. But uh, uh, I mean, uh, jokes apart, I mean, you already are seeing the Gen AI smartphones coming into it. I mean, uh, you look at Canalys figures, it's already... Uh, you know, they're talking about 1 billion uh, Gen AI enabled smartphones between calendar year 24, the, the year that we are in, uh, uh, to uh, calendar year 2027, uh, just in four years. And uh, uh, I was speaking to some Qualcomm uh, folks uh, the other day, and uh, they're already talking about Gen AI laptops coming in with the Snapdragon Elite uh, X uh, processors. So uh, I'm clearly, uh, you know, uh, collaborating what uh, you... Uh, Shrikant and you have been talking about from the electrification, we are going to see that, you know, it's going to be plug and play kind of stuff uh, on tap, as uh, Shrikant well put it. Intelligence uh, on tap. Yeah, yeah intelligence on tap. Uh, uh, Shrikant, my question to you is that a lot of these Gen AI pro uh, projects across sectors that you see, uh, regardless of whether it's in India or even uh, across the world, correct me if I'm wrong out there, but most of them are pilots as of today. Uh, in enterprises especially in in enterprises in, especially in enterprises yeah so while the foundational models have become pretty mature, and of course, there's a lot of room for improvement out there. We are having a lot of uh, SLMs. We are having a lot of fine-tuning drag, et cetera. Everything is being done. Simultaneously, we are finding a lot of these projects. Uh, are uh, enterprises finding it difficult to uh, scale these projects? Uh, uh, or is there, you know, kind of a reluctance or are they, you know, sort of inhibited with certain kind of limitations? Are they getting a little apprehensive about the hallucination parts of it, which also can be seen as features and not just, you know, uh, you know, I think it's important to also understand what hallucinations are. So is, is it that uh, the sense that you're getting from CXOs, what is the uh, reluctance or is it just that they're waiting and watching? A great question. There, there are multiple questions packed into that. I'll try to yeah. I, I know, them, I know, I unpack know. them one by one. Then the first question is, are Gen AI uh, pilots happening or as it's scaling? The answer is there are now a lot of scaled examples of Gen AI that I have witnessed personally. Okay. So I'll give you two or three examples just to illustrate and then we can go to the second and third parts of the question. So we've uh, been working with one of the large tech Manufacturing tech companies, and they're using this to summarize their customer operations. So they support devices that they make, and their device support calls last 35 minutes. We are shaving off six minutes from that 35 minutes in summarizing the call. And the summary is now happening automatically through Gen AI. So the agent can move to the next call that they have to solve for, next customer, number one. And number two, there they're also they used to audit one in 200 calls. So half a percent of calls were audited for quality purposes. Now we're auditing 100% of the calls through Gen AI and not manually. And it means that we are able to capture 30 different quality parameters of the call. Like, you know, is the agent friendly? Does she or he have the expertise? Did they solve the problem? Were there any customer dissatisfactions expressed? Whatever those data is they're capturing those 30 parameters through the call automatically. So this is the first example of a scaled, scaled use case because they're actually running 3 million calls a year. And these are all 3 million calls are going through this, number one. And I will also say that this is these things are, many of them are in development because it takes time to get these kinds of big things done. It's Gen right. AI with this GPT-3, GPT-4 was launched only in March of last year. So only 11 months since it, it took off. Uh, number two is an example of working with one of the largest asset managers. And these asset managers are essentially, think of them as they run a number of different funds. They have thousand different funds and they have advisors who talk to customers like you and me and tell us what fund we should, might suit our needs, a biotech fund or high tech fund or small cap fund, mid cap fund, whatever. They are actually having these conversations with end customers and through the conversations they have to figure out 
what is the best product that suits these this risk appetite of this these customers, their preferences, their horizon, et cetera. Now, what they're doing is they're using generative AI search interface to have this live while they're having this conversation, they're able to make the right recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, it has really taken off and it is actually being presented to the board as we speak. It's scaling very nicely. So that's the second example. Third example is a place where a company, a consumer goods company is using it to develop new products. They're actually um, using generative AI to do a landscape assessment and come up with new ideas of new product launches. So let's say I'm a laundry you know, detergent company. I'm thinking of what are the various new flavors of laundry detergent that I could launch, which, which, have, which are open space in the market. So using, using generative AI to, to augment their traditional market research and focus group discussions. And secondly, they're using generative AI to even validate how big the space is. And then using that to uh, save time and increase the rate of success rate of innovation. So these are three examples. They're all nicely scaled examples that uh, I've seen. So I think it is time that it can take off across the board. Now to a second question, what are the bottlenecks to adoption? Why did it take so long? See, when Gen AI took off around last year and the potential was very clear, everybody wanted to do pilots, but they had fears. The fears were around privacy. People thought that my data will go into, the, you know, you must have seen that situation with Samsung where some people put- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. code. Code. My code is going away. My data is going away. My customer data might get exposed. Am I violating some legal restrictions or am I violating confidentiality issues? So privacy. Yeah, trademark. Trademark. I can go safety. They felt that if I use this, could there be some kind of a prompt injection and right. my systems get exposed? Then there was security, of safety and security, and then compliance. And mm. Am I violating any legal things? By Am I violating any contract? Is there any copyright issue in using any images? So they were bottlenecks like these. So systematically, these bottlenecks have been identified and been eliminated by various players, IBM, mm -hmm. Microsoft. Everyone has come up with some solutions around copyright, some solutions around putting inside your firewalls. So those solutions have gone. And around end of last year, around uh, you know October, November last year, we started seeing the takeoff of more scaled use cases. There. So that's really the second question in terms of what is preventing these things from taking off. Jayant, you may want to add something over here. Yeah, because uh, I mean, we got numbers from BCG which said that less than 10% of all the Gen AI pilots across enterprises are being deployed into production. These are some December numbers. And even Menlo Ventures globally was talking about enterprises spending $2.5 billion in all of 2023. Uh, on Gen AI as compared to $70 billion on AI alone and uh, $400 billion on cloud. So, uh, and and most of the things that you mentioned were uh, uh, exactly what they mentioned as well. The privacy and the safety and the security compliance uh, were, were the biggest. Uh, uh... And maybe if I could add there, Jen, um, I, I didn't answer the third question that was implicit in, in that, which is around what are the what does it take from pilot to scale up, right? Why 10% yeah, yeah. are only yeah. scaling up? It turns out that showing a proof of concept is, is very easy because easy. you can use GPT-4, GPT-3, whatever, Llama, et cetera, and you can quickly spin up something and say, hey, here's the potential. Look, it's breakthrough. Right. From there to actually deploying it in the enterprise, taking care of all the safety, security things that we just spoke about, and the last mile problem solving required. So it looks 70% accurate or 80% accurate to feel like, oh, this can work. But when you, when you are actually deploying it, you need 99% accuracy or sometimes 100% accuracy. Right. You can't afford to be at 99% also. Correct. When you want to move from there, there's a lot of heavy lifting required. The hallucination becomes a problem. Uh, which is, So there are a bunch of AI problems around hallucination, around overfitting and, and so on. There are huge number of engineering problems. The data sizes are massive. Yeah. I'll just give you an example. We are building a test, uh, you know, to uh, when we uh, hire candidates, we, we hire 2,000 people a year and we 400,000 people take tests to find oh, fractures. Okay. It's a huge number. And now if we, we want to proctor the test and we want all the video feeds to come in and we want AI to figure out if there's any cheating going on, et cetera. Right. Now, we thought, yeah, we can do this. Once we started looking at the data that we are receiving per second in terms of proctoring video feeds, because two cameras, feeds, right. and video, audio, all that stuff, 
it just the scale, data scales up very quickly. So the engineering yeah. load yeah. in AI problems in Gen AI problems is vast, mm. and there are multiple engineering. There's quantization. There's hardware. I mean, some things work on some kinds of GPU. Some things don't work on some other kinds of GPU. So from right from the hardware layer to the to, to the top, the entire engineering stack is something that is hard to crack in an AI problem in a Gen AI problem when you're actually deploying it in an enterprise. And then you have the design problems, like you know, we already talked about some of those design problems in terms of safety and uh, and uh, responsible AI and copyright issues. And then you, you have to design for you have to also design for the end user to master the user experience. So when you put all of these things together, there's a lot of work required to actually make a Gen AI use case work inside a large organization and scale it up. And that's why also it's taking longer. It's not that you can literally switch it on and tomorrow you have. Yeah. That electrification you talked about, that is all, it requires work. I agree. And and I completely agree. Uh, there are AI problems and there are engineering problems. And even AI problems, AI problems are being solved literally every second quarter, right? I mean, uh, you know, the first half were, where LLMs were there were, were in terms of hallucination, first half of 2023, and the second half they were completely, uh, you know, a, a lot of them have become very crisp and tight. And, you know, every six months, especially a AI problems are being solved uh, at a massive scale. But then there is uh, engineering problems that you mentioned. In my experience, I, I need to ask you, Srikanth, I, you know, I need to bounce this off with you. In my experience, in the last five, six years, and this was pre-Gen AI uh, uh, era, the companies or the industries that were adopting AI uh, readily uh, were actually non-core technology companies, okay? And and I have my own, uh, you know, two reasons for that. One one of the reasons was in the core technology companies, in the, you know, uh, IT companies, pro software product companies, and telecom companies, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, people at the decision-making level, at the director and the VP level, who had done their, uh, you know, PhDs, masters in AI in the 80s and the 90s. And, uh, you know, they were, they were like the uh, guy calling the wolf, right? I mean... Uh, uh, they were like, yeah, we've seen this. They were during the AI winter days. Uh, yeah, we've seen AI coming and, and they were not really ready when it AI actually hit inflection point in 2015 and, six, uh, 15 and 16, right? Uh, that, that, so they were at the decision-making level. So they were not, uh, you know, accepting that AI finally hit the inflection point. That was one, uh, one reason. And the second reason is most of these non-core technology companies in the mid-2010s, uh, in the second half of 2010s, were actually investing in digital transformation, right? And when they were investing in digital digital transformation, they said, you know what, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, we we don't want to keep uh, you know changing our uh, systems or upgrading our systems regularly. So if there's a new technology that's coming in place, you know, uh, we are willing to uh, in, invest in that as well. So I've actually seen uh, you know healthcare, uh, financial services, asset management, uh, retail. Uh, and a lot of logistics, a lot of non-core technology companies actually adopting AI uh, much readily and before than the core technology companies. Has that been your observation and uh, experience as well? My observation has been that places where there is a lot of competitive pressure mm -hmm. will adopt much quicker. Uh, the okay. industries that are adopting are the ones where their moat is not strong enough. They have to be very quick innovate every day to survive. Mm. That's where you'd see innovate. That's where they'll use AI as quickly as they can. Whereas the yeah. ones where they have a very strong moat, they do not because they have very fat profit pools and they don't care if innovation doesn't happen for a few months or a few years because they've already they have a very robust business model for some reason. Right. So that right. is what I've seen as a distinguishing factor between the companies that adopt versus the companies that don't adopt. And it's only when they get threatened at the very core do they do they invent like for example google google has an incredible research yeah. they are the best research team in ai bar none yes but only when the open ai pressure came in then yeah. they suddenly said okay every product of google will have gen ai inside it they could have done that before right but it was like okay am i threatening my own search business model you know by creating this generative ai thing am i yeah. Do I need to run all the comp computation I have to run for every product to throw in the in extra intelligence layer? Do I really need it? So there would always be a reluctance to innovate because it's very expensive to innovate at this level that, for a free quote unquote free product. Yeah. Only when the competitive pressure starts coming and you start like, really moving forward. 
I think the I, if, especially if you look at the IT industry and the telecom industry, telecom industry has extraordinary profit pool and very oligop yeah. oligopolistic market. Uh, so yeah. that's why I feel like they don't innovate as fast. No, in telecom, uh, I'm ex-telecom, by the way. In telecom, we have something called as a 4 by, four, four, four rule. Uh, any cutting edge technology is available for the telecom industry four years ahead of uh, it hitting the inflection point. The telecom industry takes about four years to decide whether to adopt the technology or not. By the time they adopt and implement it, they're four years too late. Okay, so that's a four, four, four rule that we hear about in the telecom Fantastic. industry. So, yeah, uh, you know, I, I want to remember this and use it in future somewhere. You should. <laughs> so my question to both of you is like, okay, you know, uh, typically in my conversations with all the CXOs, uh, I mean, so there are, uh, there are two questions, actually. Let me ask the first question. When we are dealing with uh, legacy uh, or traditional companies, the non-core kind of, uh, not uh, uh, techie kind of companies, conglomerates for that matter of fact, or enterprises that have multiple units, they could have uh, a retail unit, they could have a tire unit, they could have you know multiple businesses within one kind of business. When they have to develop a kind of AI strategy, they already you know, probably part of uh, the apprehension or the reluctance comes on the fact that, uh, uh, you know, they have to tie up these multiple kind of units and understand the AI strategy for all the units as a cohesive uh, uh, own. Uh, it, probably it is a little simpler if uh, there's a single line of business. Is that uh, your, uh, would you concur with that kind of a thought process? Yeah, I think uh, largely true. Wherever there is uh, organizational complexity, I think innovation can suffer. And second point I would say is that is the is where they are in the innovation cycle of AI. So all, for example, in AI, what we have seen is that first companies start by creating a centralized team for AI. Hmm. That's the yeah. because nobody understands this electricity thing. Nobody understands right now. So let's just right. create one team that understands it. Yeah. Then the second stage is what is called federated, where you have a central team, but you have local teams that are supporting each business unit. And in the third stage, you have the decentralized situation where everybody is doing their own thing. So let's say, even if it's a large business, conglomerate with business units, if they're in the third stage, innovation can take, take place because they're almost independently run, their AI is working. And so a company like Microsoft was in that third state throughout, right? It's, it's very decentralized. Google is the third state. The challenge with sometimes what happens in these industries where this decentralized is that if suddenly you have a breakthrough change in AI, right. right? then none of the decentralized teams are good enough to have cracked that problem and they just go behind a few years. And that's what you see in Microsoft saying, look, I'm going to go to open AI and literally, you know, say that open AI is my AI strategy. It's a very big statement for, I mean, you know, hats off to Satya for having the humility to say that, but a, Microsoft would think of itself as an AI company and they had very credible AI research for many years before that years. for giving up all of that and going to Sam. And I saw a podcast where Sam Altman was talking to I think the, uh, the founder of another company and that guy asked him, do you think Microsoft is an AI company? And then Sam Altman thinks for like 30 <laughs> seconds and says, no, I don't think so. They're not an AI company. I was like, okay, this is, I don't know what this is. This is arrogance or this is... <laughs> this is true that I don't know what it is, but it's it's funny. It's it, but Microsoft has had the humility to do that. But to answer your question, I think it's it's complex, and this is some of the thoughts behind it. Talking of that, uh, coming to Fractal, I mean, I am personally fairly impressed by the kind of companies that you guys have been uh, uh, either incubating and or investing. You know, uh, Senseforth, Cure. Uh, Asper, Crux, and Flyfish, especially Crux and Flyfish, uh, you know, you guys have moved really fast and and uh, Asper as well, moved really fast as soon as the Gen AI, uh, this one took over. Uh, you know, uh, talk to us about, uh, you know, Fractal's thought process and this one when it comes to incubating, growing, in, uh, investing and acquiring, uh, you know, some of these companies and products. That's a great question. Firstly, I sincerely believe in the Jeff Bezos philosophy that if you want to be truly client centric or customer centric you have to innovate ahead of the need so you have to invest in r and d and we have a philosophy that is today tomorrow and day after like whole world be divided into today tomorrow and day after and we have to spend spend our monies for to, to win today to win tomorrow let's say 12 this is 12 to 18 months and win the day after which is well beyond let's say 18 months 24 months 
So we invested in those kinds of research areas right throughout. We invested something like 10% of our revenues on R&D throughout our journey. Mm -hmm. So when Crux, for example, was well ahead of its curve, we did Crux in 2015, 2016, well before oh, wow. GPTs came in. Exactly. So we were, so when GPT hit and uh, we could just increase the accuracy significantly because now we could plug in the engine. All oh, right. Or GPT, GPT-4 or GPT-3. Right. So what we benefited from is that we had built all these products well before Gen AI came in. Mm. All we had to do was to infuse the Gen AI layer and they became much, much better after Gen AI came in. And if we had to start from 2023, we couldn't have made, we, we wouldn't have been there. So Flyfish, yeah. for example, is doing customer, Flyfish is only set up in 2023, but the idea behind Flyfish is how can I have conversational interface towards commerce? Right? So if I want to buy something, I want to buy the latest lipstick or I want to prepare for a party this evening. What products should I buy? How can I have a sales agent talk to me and recommend the right outfit for me and solve my problem as opposed to selling a product to me, right? That's the idea of Flyfish through conversational interface. So these ideas are all very interesting and new and they become very feasible in the Gen AI world. So I'm glad that we invested enough money before this took off. So now we can leverage all these investments in yeah, I mean, Flyfish, a straightforward use case. What I'm personally, uh, you know, impressed and excited by also is about Asper. I mean, the entire decision-making engine, uh, you know, there is where you're talking about intelligence being on top, uh, on tap, you know, decision-making, decision-making itself being on tap, okay? Uh, with, with all the, all, all the different inputs uh, being ingested and, yeah, go on, sorry. So in, in case of Asper, it is like an engine that's sitting at the heart of a business Right. You have demand, you have supply, you have pricing. It sort of triangulates all of this into the thinking behind how to make decisions for the growing your business. And that's really the, it's it's like the central processing unit of a, of a, of a big consumer goods company. That's really how it has been set up. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good vision and it's really uh, taking so, off now. Taking a step back, uh, you know, uh, talk us through your, a uh, product roadmap strategy or a portfolio strategy, you know, with with all these companies, uh, what 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 goes on in uh, in in Fractal's uh, management mind, you know, when uh, in terms of building the portfolio of the products. First of all, we think of what is next from a client vantage point. So, what is mm -hmm. inventing and investing on client behalf? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. That's how we generate ideas. Right. The second way we generate ideas is we have all these budding entrepreneurs within Fractal who are who are coming with nice, crazy ideas. We give them enough time and money to explore those ideas. So then we take some of these ideas and we think of us as investing in these ideas. Mm -hmm. they, we, we have a products unit which incubates many of these ideas. We're investing in R&D. We have deep R&D and some relatively shallow R&D to support, support this. Right. And then once these products start taking off and we feel like there's a product market fit and they can be an independent business, then we spin it off and ask them, give them enough capital to survive for a couple of years and right. then ask them to go raise capital on their own. Right. So we've had uh, three That's such- That's what happened with Cure, Cure, right? Yes. Cure and Sensefort, both, I think. Yeah. So Cure took, took off very nicely. Took we off. incubated in, and then uh, Cure is a healthcare AI company that's solving for lung cancer, tuberculosis, right. uh, COVID, et cetera. And it's working really nicely with, let's say, with AstraZeneca, with four of the you know, NHS trusts, and so on. It's it's solving very important problems. It was born in in our conference room. We incubated for five years, and 2020 we spun it off. Sequoia invested money. Mass Mutual Ventures invested money, and then 2022 Health Quad, Novo Nordisk invested. It's taken off very nicely. Some 10 million people around the world have benefited from Cure Solutions. It's really taken off nicely, and that is the path for every company. Now every company doesn't make it all the way. And there's a creative destruction involved in failure. Right. And we are also humble enough to say that we tried. It was a good idea. It didn't fail. It didn't succeed. So we will absorb it back, or we will, or we will say, let's use the repurpose the team to build a new idea. Yeah, that's really the mindset of uh, innovation. No, this is this is exactly Google's model of innovation, and and it's very heartening to see an Indian company pulling this off. Uh, you know, more power to guy to you guys, honestly. Thank you. It's still we're still in the early stages, but. I think we've had a couple of good successes. One of them is Theramin.ai, which invests quantitatively in the in the stock markets. Mm -hmm. It uses machine, it loses data from uh, you know price volume data, but also alternate data to make investments in the equity markets. 
okay. using machine learning algorithms. And then you know that is set up as a fund, et cetera. And now it's it's raised a couple of rounds of funding. Hopefully it's uh, we, we, we may have some news on that front too. So that's that's to Cure and uh, Theremin. And a couple of others are also in that journey of taking off. But we know that if, even if you have a 50% success rate, I think that's way better than an average. Uh, I mean, definitely, a VC right? A, a VC it, success rate, yes. definitely. Yes. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to uh, check with you, 24 years of, uh, uh, in, you know, of Fractal. When you guys started off in 2000, uh, you know, uh, talk, talk to me about the uh, genesis thought process of Fractal. Were you always, uh, you know, going to be an analytics company to start with? And, and how did the genesis this, uh, take off? What's the genesis story? So when we started Fractal in 2000, very first few months, let's say first six months, we were trying to help consumers in making better buying decisions. So mm-hmm. we would we would recommend the best so best cell phone for you given your preferences we would say this cell phone of all the 150 models of cell phone available in the market we would give them the top 3 that fit their needs right and by by taking asking them some questions etc we would have a little algorithm to power that so that failed miserably we couldn't take it off uh, and then we did some soul searching and said what are we really good at this is like first year of business right and we said you know we we understand math really mm-hmm. well Mm-hmm. And we want to use math, we know is very powerful in solving problems and making helping companies. Pranay and I, the two co-founders, we had worked uh, on India's first collateralized debt obligation. We had used a lot of mathematics in doing okay. debentures in such a way that you could raise money against it. So it was a lot of mathematics, interesting stuff. India's first CDO. So we were fresh off that experience. So we said, right. you know what, math is important for businesses. Let's mm-hmm. see how we can make it work. And then as we thought further, we realized that math essentially in the enterprise context means you have to work this math on the data. Right. And then we started building models. First thing we did was to predict default rates on consumers, on credit cards and personal loans. And then we, so banking was a second, we did predicted churn in telecom. That was in very early days. We worked with right. consumer goods companies in predicting customer behavior and, and figuring out promotions, et cetera. And then it was so intoxicating because it's a beautiful combination of math and psychology. We're right. doing mathematics and we're trying to understand consumer behavior. And this has been a lifelong journey since then of bringing in data sciences, but also human behavior understanding and human decision understanding. Right. And it's always been about powering human decisions. Even the first thing we did was about powering consumer decisions. So in that sense, we have been true to that vision of powering decisions. Yeah. Okay, so that's 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 been the genesis story, and uh, and good, you know, like Steve Jobs says, it takes fifteen years to have that overnight success. Uh, <laughs> you know, you guys are twenty four years, and in the twenty first year, you turned a unicorn by revenue. Uh, you know, and now, uh, you know, talk to us about the future of Fractal, uh, Leslie. Leslie talked, uh, you know, talked about your uh, uh, fifteen billion dollar revenue target that you guys are, uh, uh, you guys are looking at. The, the future, what lies in the future of Fractal? Firstly, I think it's a very simple strategy. Mm-hmm. We don't want to serve everybody. We want to serve the biggest, most admired companies on the planet. Right. We have a definition called 10, 20, 30. Mm-hmm. Companies that are at least 10 billion in revenue, uh, 20 billion in market cap, or have 30 million consumers that they serve. Very nice. When you look at that set of companies that are really scaled enterprises across industries, there are about a thousand companies in the world that meet that definition. Right. We want to serve half of those, if not all of them. Right. And we want to build a strong partnership with them where they're spending something like $30 million annually with us. So the simple math for 15 billion is 500 multiplied by 30, 30 million. equal to 50, 1500, which is $15 billion. 15 15, million. $15 million. That's that's, the, that's a simple math. That's the strategy. <laughs> no, that's good actually. And you know, I mean, I my company is twelve and a half years old now, and I can completely relate when you say that we don't want to work with everyone. Okay, <laughs> totally, totally agree. You know, I think that some of some of this maturity comes only o- over time. Okay, <laughs> so the power great. to say no is very yeah. powerful because it gives you the opportunity and the flexibility to serve the stakeholders that you want to serve very, very well. Exactly. So you try to serve everybody. You feel like you know it's you. It's nice. 
it just comes at the expense of being able to serve your clients really really well so this power yeah. of focus has been it has been transformational for us yeah no i i think in my 12th 13th year of my my own personal journey i can i can completely relate to what what you're saying okay on that note uh, shrikant it's been a pleasure having you on on our podcast uh, you know very enlightening and i'm sure our audience and uh, listeners would also agree with this and thanks for all the inputs insights and uh, you know and and all your uh, uh, knowledge and wisdom okay have a have a great day and good luck to you and fractal going forward thank you jayan thanks leslie